Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello. So in this lecture, we'll talk about Look Back in Anger, uh, the play by John Osborne that we'll be covering in this course. So I believe we've already talked about the background of the drama, the background of the play, the cultural condition which produced the play. So today we'll dive right into the text. We'll talk about what happens in the text, uh, who are the main characters, the plot of the drama, and how is it relevant, most importantly, how is it relevant to the context, uh, in, a, in a context of gender and literature. In other words, uh, what, is, uh, what are the gender complexities in the play? the reason why we are looking at the play in the first place. So Look Back in Anger, as I mentioned in one of my lectures prior to this, uh, is a drama which sort of started off what we now call the Angry Young Man Movement, uh, which is about uh, you know, the very discontented, angry, uh, disillusioned young man who is sort of cynical, uh, who was a romantic at one point in time, who had great promises, who had great hopes in the world, but now is increasingly getting cynical and discontented and grumpy. Uh, and angry with the cultural conditions around him. So as you can, uh, you probably have imagined by now, this is a movement which uh, very quickly uh, you know, crossed boundaries. It came to India, it spilled over uh, into popular mediums such as Bollywood. So if you remember the, the films in the 1970s and 80s starring Amitabh Bachchan, uh, those were basically uh, an extension of the, of the angry young man movement, uh, which again portrayed this very angry, discontented and disillusioned young man uh, who was very cynical about his location in the world. Uh, and the cultural condition around him. So Look Back in Anger as a drama uh, was a pioneer in, in some sense of this angry young man movement. So the protagonist in Look Back in Anger is Jimmy Porter. So he's the first character we will study in this particular lecture, Jimmy Porter. So Jimmy Porter, as we get to know in the play, is a 25 year old Englishman uh, who has been to university, has a university degree, but is essentially jobless. In other words, he doesn't really have a job which is commensurate to his credentials. So he has, he runs a sweet stall in a market, in an open market, which is not something you expect uh, a university graduate to do. And this immediately tells you something about the cultural condition of the time. Uh, so why is, the first question that you should be asking uh, at this point is, why is a university graduate like Jimmy Porter, who has been to university, educated, etc., uh, you know, finding himself running a sweet stall in an open market? So that immediately tells you something about the political and cultural condition of England at that point of time. So this is an England which, I, as I suggested, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, is essentially economically emasculated. This is a bankrupt England. This is post-1947. Uh, the empire has ended. Uh, you know, India is a free country. England is no longer an imperial power. The Second World War had made England bankrupt, etc. So England is no longer uh, you know, a dominant power in a global scene. The two dominant powers which have replaced England in the global scene are USA and the USSR, America and Russia. So this is also a time which could be seen as the beginning of the Cold War. Uh, the war which never really happened, but the war which uh, so was always happening in the background, uh, in rhetoric, uh, in political situations, etc. So this is the, the cultural condition of look back in anger. And as I suggested immediately, the Jimmy Porter is an Englishman who is a university graduate, but essentially he is jobless, or he's, he's doing a job which is way beneath him in terms of his credentials. He's running a sweet stall in a market. So this is the first thing we know about Jimmy Porter. Now, if you look at the play, and I believe you probably by now have acquired the text, you probably have a copy of the play with you, look back in anger. If you don't, please get it as quickly as possible. Uh, it's also available online, so you can download it and read it as well. So if you look at the stage directions in look back in anger, the very opening stage directions in look back in anger, you'll find that it's a very graphic and detailed description of the, of the Porter household uh, somewhere in the Midlands, right? So, you know, this is a very typical London, uh, you, know, uh, you know, houses run by the government. So this is uh, not really a very posh house. It's not really a very posh neighborhood at all. So this is, a, is a, one of those houses which came up uh, post-1945, post-Second World War, which are now called council houses, right? So these are houses built by the council, a local council, which are inhabited largely by uh, the poor people, the poorer section of the population. 
So this is what Jimmy Porter does. Uh, so it's a very, it's an old Victorian house, but at the same time, it's got a Victorian architecture about it, but it's very quickly converted into a council house. So again, that tells you something. The conversion of a Victorian house into a council house tells you something about the economic shift, the economic condition of England at that point of time. So it's very quickly converting from a Victorian kind of economy into a more post-Second World War uh, a, a kind of economy which is essentially bankrupt, uh, impoverished, emasculated in some sense. Right? So this is the house in which the action of Lubbock and Anger mostly happens. We, we hardly see anything outside Lubbock and Anger, outside this house in Lubbock and Anger. So we get to know uh, what happens elsewhere, outside. But the main action, the main plot uh, of, the, of the drama uh, takes place inside this particular house. So it's very important that we study the house in great details as we read the play. So uh, it's got a Victorian architecture, it's got an Edwardian window, but it's essentially a council housing. And this is why Jimmy Porter stays with his wife, Alison Porter, who used to be Alison Redfern, uh, and then interestingly with his friend, Cliff. Uh, Cliff Lewis. Now, Cliff is a friend of Jimmy, but he sort of has this very interesting location and look back in anger. So, in some sense, he is, uh, you know, Jimmy's friend, uh, the male, you know, uh, friend of Jimmy, and Jimmy and he share some very intimate moments. They confess to each other, they confide to each other. But in a, in a sense, uh, his relationship with Alison, Jimmy's wife, is very complex. So we could read it as a brotherly relation, a brotherly sisterly relation. They're very fond of each other. It's very affectionate. Um, kind of a relationship, but also it's, more, it's quite intimate. So Alison tells Cliff certain things which she can't bring herself to tell Jimmy, as we will see in the play. So it's a very interesting triangle of human relationship that we find in Look Back in Anger right away. And this is one of the many things which made the play so complex uh, as a drama. So we have Jimmy Porter, the main, the, the protagonist in Look Back in Anger, living in a council house in Midlands with his wife, Alison Porter, who used to be Alison Redfern. Uh, who happens to be the, the, the daughter of a colonel, uh, Colonel Redfern, who was stationed in India. So India, again, is a very important presence in Lubbock and Anger. It almost becomes a character in Lubbock and Anger, as we'll see when you read the play. Because, you know, this is a post-India England, a post-imperial India England. So, you know, in, in, in India in Lubbock and Anger is a bit of, bit of a nostalgic presence. Uh, it becomes a signifier of imperial nostalgia, something which was there at one point of time, something which uh, represented or, you know, was a metaphor for abundance, a uh, metaphor for, you know, uh, richness, etc., which is now gone. So this is a very, very uh, impoverished England, which can just look back in nostalgia to an imperial India, right? So in India, again, is a very important character and look back in anger, and we'll talk about that in more details. But for the moment, it's important for you to understand that this is a post-imperial England, so India enters the scene as a third person presence, uh, as, as, as a territory of desire, as a territory of nostalgia, uh, which was there at one point of time, which is now gone. So uh, Jimmy's wife, uh, um, Alison Redfern, or Alison Porter, as she is now called, was born in India. Uh, so she's a daughter, as I just mentioned, of a colonel who was stationed in India as an imperial officer working for, uh, working for the British Queen. So she grew up entirely in India. Uh, and she spent a good part of her childhood and early youth in India, and she came back to England only after 1947, when India became independent as a state, and where the empire came to an end. So she is, uh, she's again a very complex character. So she comes back to an England, which is very different from the kind of Englishness which she had in mind. And we'll talk about that in more details later, the different kinds of Englishness in Lubbock and Anger, the different kinds of Britishness in Lubbock and Anger. So first of all, let's focus on the, the principal character, the protagonist in Lubbock and Anger, who is uh, Jimmy Porter. So Jimmy Porter, we are told, is a 25-year-old man. Uh, so he is uh, a disconcerting mixture, I mark the words, it's very, very important words, and I hope you're reading it from the book as I'm telling you this. He's a disconcerting mixture of kindness, tenderness, and free-booting cruelty. Right? So, you know, the very beginning of the play, we get to know that Jimmy is a very, very complex person. Complex, why? Because he's a disconcerting mixture. It's a very unsettling kind of a mixture of contradictions. So he's a construct of contradictions in some sense. So he's very tender, very kind, and also mercilessly cruel. He's almost a sadist on certain occasions, and he's like a child, an affectionate child on certain other occasions. So he, he keeps combining all these different attributes, which makes him such a complex character in the first place. And I think, I, I believe it did mention at some point in my previous lecture, that there are critics, there are some very interesting scholarship, uh, you know, which have compared 
um, who have compared uh, Jimmy Porter with Hamlet. Uh, because you know, there are some commonalities we can observe in both the characters. And both of them uh, have a very similar kind of attitude towards women. Both of them are very, very neurotic. Both of them are very, very repressed in their own ways. And both of them are romantics uh, who can't bring themselves on to enact their actions. Okay? So Jimmy Porter too, like Hamlet, is trapped in a social and cultural situation. So look back in anger, the very beginning of the play will give you the idea, the, the, the feeling of claustrophobia. So you get to know Jimmy's uh, you know, one bedroom apartment in the Midlands, uh, which is very, very claustrophobic. It's inha inhabited by three people, so there's hardly any privacy of people. You know, they can't afford a better house, they can't afford a more, uh, a more open uh, uh, you know, place to live in. So that, that particular house itself becomes a metaphor for claustrophobia, cultural claustrophobia. right? So it's the kind of place which uh, stifles you. Uh, it's the kind of place which you know, doesn't allow agency, doesn't allow expression, right? So that's the kind of place where the action happens. So Jimmy Porter, the protagonist, is a disconcerting mixture of tenderness and freebooting cruelty, right? Of malice and kindness, of uh, absolute sincerity and absolute, uh, you know, malice. So, you know, he, he's, he's a kind of person who is extremely complex and extremely, uh, is a mixture of opposites in a certain sense. And that's what makes them such a difficult person to analyze and equally a difficult person to live with, as you find in the course of the play. So, uh, you know, we get to know that absolute sincerity uh, or, or blistering sincerity like his makes few friends. So, his kind of sincerity is blistering, you know, it's absolutely unequivocal, it's absolute. He has no half measures, it's either all or nothing. And he's the kind of person who makes very few friends. So, he's the kind of person who will antagonize people very, very quickly because, you know, he is someone who doesn't mince words, he's someone was directly expressive, he's someone who doesn't equivocate, so someone who's absolutely clear uh, in his uh, articulation, uh, in his malice, his kindness, and his tenderness, so ab everything about him, whether it's a positive attribute or a negative attribute, everything about Jimmy Porter is absolutely straightforward and assertive. So that's the first thing we get to know about him, the assertive quality of Jimmy Porter. He's someone who doesn't mince words. Right? So he, interestingly, as you find in the play, uh, the first scene we have in the play is two men sitting in a sofa reading newspapers. Right? That's the first picture we get, the first image we get uh, you know, as, the play, as the curtains go up. So two men you know, sprawled on a sofa reading newspapers, the faces are covered with newspapers uh, and the two men obviously happen to be Jimmy Porter and Cliff, his best friend. So, you know, the play opens with this, uh, with this particular scene, with this particular image, and we get to see, uh, you know, more and more details as the curtains go up and as the directions, uh, you know, direct us to. So, uh, we get to know, we get to see that Jimmy Porter is, uh, you know, smoking a, a pipe, which is again very, very interesting, and I'll come back to the signifier of the pipe uh, in a bit. He's also wearing a very shabby and almost torn tweed jacket. So, you know, the tweed jacket and the pipe, they're signifiers of what? The signifiers of class, the signifiers of educated, elitist kind of an Englishness, right? Now, this is something which is very, very interesting because you know, uh, you know, one of the things which we'll remember as we do this particular course is that no studies and no school of criticism can exist alone. So, when you're looking at Look Back in Anger as a gender studies play, as a masculinity or femininity play, you know, it's absolutely impossible that you know, we divorce the class component of the play, that we divorce the social component of the play. And this is a play which is also, uh, you know, absolutely embedded uh, in, the, in the struggle of class, in the location of class, in the politics of class and class identifications. So we have Jimmy Porter, who is supposedly an angry young man, who is this working class hero, who once supposed was a working class hero, but at the same time, uh, he is wearing a tweed jacket, which is traditionally worn by the elite of England, and he's smoking a pipe. So the pipe and the tweed jacket become metonymic markers. You know, you, you know what metonymy markers are. So these are little bits which indicate a, 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 a bigger picture, right? So for instance, uh, you can talk about, you know, the spectre indicating royalty or the gun indicating power, authority or whatever, right? So, you know, the tweed jacket and, this, and, 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 a, and the pipe that Jimmy is smoking, they become metonymic markers of his aspiration towards a certain kind of class. So he's aspiring, uh, sartorially at least, he's aspiring to, to, to elevate himself into a certain kind of class location. But at the same time, he wants to pose as a working class hero. So immediately, we have different markers of masculinity coming in. So in contrast to that, we have someone called Cliff, you know, as I mentioned earlier. Now Cliff is someone who's obviously more straightforward, someone who's more direct, someone who's less complex than Jimmy. So he is someone uh, who is uh, in your face, uh, he is unequivocally ignorant, uh, he's completely disconnected with the world, 
So he's someone that Jimmy can bully uh, at will. So he's someone Jimmy can feel superior to compared to him. So some people have compared, uh, certain scholars have compared Cliff with Horatio. So again, this Hamlet-Horatio dynamic, if you remember, so Hamlet being this uh, neurotic, uh, extreme, repressed, masculine self, and Horatio being a calm counterpoint uh, to Hamlet. So we have a similar kind of dynamic being replicated and looked back in anger uh, to a certain extent. So we have uh, Jimmy Porter, who is this neurotic, uh, you, know, you know, mixture of uh, all kinds of opposites, a disconcerting mixture, the dramatist tells us. And in contrast to that, we have Cliff, who is unequivocally lazy, um, ignorant, uh, someone who is sort of a very nice, affectionate person, someone who is uncomplicated, way uncomplicated compared to Jimmy. So we have these two men at the very opening of the play. And they are sort of sitting together, smoking, uh, Jimmy is smoking a cigar, a, a pipe, sorry. And um, they're, they're reading newspapers on Sunday morning. And the location of Sunday is very, very important. So it's a Sunday morning, and all the two uh, sit together and uh, read newspapers uh, and pass the time away. Now, the first line uh, that we get to see, the first dialogue which is spoken in look back in anger, is Jimmy Porter uh, putting the paper down and saying, another Sunday. Right, another Sunday gone, and this is an example, this is a, an expression of inertia, an expression of tiredness and exhaustion. So he's a, he's a person who's essentially trapped in his times. So he's someone who's trapped between one Sunday and another Sunday, where he ends up doing nothing. And he says, our youth is going away, our youth is slipping away. So again, we get this, uh, this feeling of exhaustion, this feeling of elevation, this feeling of being completely liquidated by time. So he's someone who cannot occupy the dominant marker of masculinity anymore. Right? So the two men in Look Back in Anger are, Jim, are very different, obviously. Jimmy Porter, who is aspiring to be the dominant masculine person, who is aspiring to be the working class hero, while at the same time aspiring at the same time, uh, you know, do, elevating himself into some kind of a educated elite person. So he's an educated elite working class hero, uh, which is not so much of a contradiction if we look at the political reality around us today. So you know, the people who aspire to be working class heroes end up looking very, very posh and elitist. And we see that happening uh, all the time around us, uh, closer to home, etc. Right? So we, we get that picture and look back in anger in the 1956 play, uh, which in a way makes it very, very prophetic, politically prophetic. Right? So now the after the two men are described by the, the, the dramatists, we get to see for the first time the woman in the play, uh, Alison, Alison uh, Porter, or Alison Redfern. So Alison obviously uh, is very, very, I mean, she's described as someone who's very, very beautiful, someone who's elegant, and uh, interestingly, she's wearing one of Jimmy's shirts. Now, one of the things which we should be very careful about and look back in anger is the sartorial symbolism in the play. So what do I mean by sartorial symbolism? The kind of dresses people wear in this particular play, and what are the symbolic significance of the dresses people wear? So at the very beginning of Look Back and Anger, we get to see Alison wearing one of Jimmy's shirts. But the, the description tells us immediately after that she still manages to look quite elegant in it. Now what does that tell us? That she is wearing Jimmy's shirt. So in a way, she becomes uh, a possession of Jimmy. So she doesn't really have a shirt of her own. She doesn't really have, she doesn't seem to have at least, uh, you know, something a dress of her own. So she is uh, wearing Jimmy's shirt. So she's essentially imprisoned by the construct of Jimmy, by the masculinity of Jimmy. But at the same time, the, the direction also tells us that she still manages to look quite elegant in it. And the word elegant over here is very, very interesting because elegance obviously is anti-working class. It's not something which you uh, associate with working class people. It's something which is, uh, you know, almost sometimes derogatively and pejoratively uh, associated with elitism. Mm -hmm. So elegance and elitism sometimes go hand in hand. So the fact that Alison still manages to look elegant despite wearing Jimmy's shirt tells us a lot. It tells us, A, that she is sort of a possession of Jimmy, in a sense, but at the same time, she still manages to retain her sense of individuality. Because remember, as I just told you, she is someone who grew up in India. She's someone who has a very posh imperial background. She's someone uh, who's very used to being waited upon, etc. So she, elegance is something which comes naturally to her. Right? So it's like a glow to her. It's like something that she is used to being uh, from the very uh, childhood that she, she has had. So the fact that she still manages to look very elegant uh, despite wearing Jimmy's shirt tells us something uh, about her location. Now, uh, what we, well, when we see Alison for the first time, we see her ironing on an ironing board. She has a pile of clothes that she's ironing and there's an ironing board. Now, it's very important that we look at the symbolism in, in Look Back in Anger. So one of the very first symbols uh, which uh, are given to us uh, is the ironing board. There are many symbols in the opening direction, but the, the one we're focusing on at the moment is the ironing board of 
uh, Alison, the place, the board where she puts the pile of clothes and irons all day. And she seems to be ironing almost you know, the entire day. And we don't seem to see her doing anything else apart from ironing uh, the dresses of Jimmy and Cliff. Now, the fact that she doesn't do anything, the fact that she is sort of reduced to ironing a pile of clothes, uh, which are basically uh, in, uh, the clothes of the men, tell us something about the condition of Alison Redfern and look back in anger. So again, you can look at the transition from being a posh, uh, elite, imperial woman into becoming the wife of someone who runs a street stall and you know, spending the entire day uh, ironing clothes and ironing board, you know, ironing clothes for men and ironing boards. And tell us something about that, tells us something about the, the, the deflation of the woman, you know, the fall of the woman and look back in anger. She doesn't really seem to have much of an agency, financial or otherwise. Uh, she doesn't really speak much. Uh, she's spoken to almost entirely. Uh, and again, if you remember what we did uh, when we studied uh, Shatan Shikilari or the chess players, we had a similar situation about the woman in Shatan Shikilari or the chess players, where we have the, the, the wives of the two uh, Nawabs, Mir and Mirza, the Begums of the two Nawabs. They are obviously seen to be much more intelligent, much more intuitive than the men, but obviously they're imprisoned by the times. They're, you know, they're the prisoners of the times, the prisoners of the values of the times, so they can't really do much about it. Now, the situation is a li little different in look back in anger, but despite that, we see Alison Redfern you know, just standing on the ironing board and ironing all day, and that's something which is a bit of a tragedy of the woman in look back in anger, although things do change subsequently in the play. Now, uh, at the beginning of the play, when the stage directions are coming into place, when they're being sort of exfoliated in front of you, uh, we get to see uh, a symbolism, you know, there are many symbols in the first two pages of look back in anger, and one of the many symbols which we'll see in Look Back in Anger is a teddy bear and a squirrel, a toy squirrel, a, a toy teddy bear and a toy squirrel. So the two toys in Look Back in Anger, they become extremely symbolic in the play. And we get to know, uh, and at the end of the play, they come back uh, with renewed symbolism, with renewed richness uh, of symbolism, which, you know, are there in Look Back in Anger. But at the moment, uh, what we, we, we ask to notice the two toys. Uh, the tattered toy, uh, the, both the toys are tattered, uh, the, the teddy bear and the toy squirrel. So they are there. So it's like a little bit of an unholy cacophony. Uh, and that, that expression comes in the play. Uh, it's used by the dramatists in, in, in certain points in the play. It's a very unholy cacophony, a very complex cacophony of toys, uh, you know, torn toys, torn furniture, exhausted men and women sitting together in a very small apartment in West London. So that's, that's basically uh, the, the setting in Look Back in Anger, and you get to see the claustrophobia, the stagnation, uh, the, 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 you know, the lack of action in Look Back in Anger, which is obviously man reflective of the lack of political agency, the lack of political action in Look Back in Anger, which, which determines the gender locations in the play. Now, uh, if you go back to the very beginning of this course, when we talk about the critical theory, with the, with the critical terms which you're using in this course, one of the terms which you used quite extensively was performativity, right? We talked about performativity as performance which is uh, designed to generate an effect. So it, it, the effect could be awe, wonder, surprise, fear, love, adulation, a combination of all these in different, you know, different degrees, etc. Now, performativity is a very, very important factor in look back and anger. Now, at the very beginning, we know this is a play, so it's been performed. These are people uh, on stage who are acting out certain roles. But even within the play, we have certain, some, several instances of performativity where Jimmy wants to become something. Uh, the character Jimmy Porter wants to become something else. So we, we saw at the very beginning, at the very opening of the play, how we see him for the first time wearing a tweed jacket and smoking a pipe, reading newspapers. And that, that picture, if you picture that in your mind, someone who's wearing a you know, tweed jacket, smoking a pipe, and reading newspapers on a Sunday morning, and that isn't really your typical picture of a working class person, is it? So that is something which you associate more with a genteel person, with someone who's been to university, someone who's posh, someone who's educated, someone who's elite, right? So Jimmy Porter, at the very beginning of the play, uh, ironically appears very, very elitist. So he's someone uh, uh, you know, who's reading a newspaper, the, 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 you know, the Sunday newspapers, and then, of course, he's wearing uh, an, a jacket which is normally conventionally worn by university uh, people, academics, and white collar people. And then, of course, he's smoking a pipe, which again is symbolic of you know, his aspiration to appear uh, you know, elitist, appear gentle, uh, appear as a posh person. Now, interestingly, the rhetoric in Lubbeck and Nanga is very, very gendered. So, you know, uh, we talked about at the beginning of the course how language, some of the language can be a very, very gendered entity. So, look back in anger, uses language in a very gendered kind of a way. So, it's a language of violence. 
and look back in anger. If you read the play, it's a very angry language. It's a language directed against the woman. So the language is very, very male and look back in anger. And woman and look back in anger are targeted uh, with the violence in language. So the rhetoric of look back in anger is a rhetoric of rage, a rhetoric of anger, uh, you know, which is directed directly targeted uh, towards the woman. And that makes the play uh, really, really interesting and complex, especially in relation to gender studies. Okay? And we have lots of swear words in Look Back in Anger, uh, almost entirely directed towards the woman. Uh, you know, the, the body of the woman is attacked verbally in Look Back in Anger, rhetorically in Look Back in Anger. So again, you know, the, the woman in Look Back in Anger uh, is something, is, is an object to be attacked, an object to be possessed, an object to be uh, you know, invaded uh, by the men in Look Back in Anger. So it's a very, very typical masculinist kind of an enterprise in Look Back in Anger. But what makes it more complex and interesting is how this entire masculinity enterprise is essentially castrated. It's essentially important. Uh, is powerless completely. So we saw when we read The Fly by Catherine Mansfield, if you remember uh, the short story which we read, uh, it's essentially a story about deflation. So the story opens with a, a huge masculine ego, the boss sitting very, very regally in the sofa, and then the story progresses. We see him getting less and less important, uh, more and more weak, and the story ends with him shivering and struggling to remember what he had been thinking about when the story opens. So, you know, again, that particular story is a very classic case in point. Uh, of a gradual uh, decrease in masculine virility, masculine strength, masculine power, right? So we, we look back in anger, there are attempts to assume the powerful position, there are attempts to assume that dominant hegemonic position by the man, uh, and that obviously comes at the cost of the woman. So Jimmy Porter is consistently and constantly attacking his wife verbally, uh, attacking his mother-in-law verbally. So the body of the woman in look back in anger is mercilessly attacked by the man verbally, rhetorically, and it almost becomes visceral. So it's an entire uh, relation between uh, the verbal and the visceral and look back in anger. You know the meaning of visceral. It's something related to the body, to the veins. You can actually feel it through the body. So language, the verbal attack and look back in anger become visceral in the quality. Uh, and that is obviously uh, you know, part of the gender studies which we'll do in look back in anger. How the language is so male in look back in anger. And how the receiver of the language is female. So that's something that you could expect a question on uh, in, in, in the context of this particular drama. The so language in the back in anger. It's a very male, uh, phallic, um, educated uh, language which is used, manipulated, uh, and so constructed to become a device uh, to attack the woman with. Right? And the woman's body becomes open for attack, open for slaughter uh, with this particular verbal, uh, visceral language that Jimmy Porter uses. Now, having talked about the language and look back in anger, and obviously this is an issue which will keep coming back in the play as we read in more details, but for the moment, let's go back to the symbols and look back in anger. So we saw at the very beginning, this was an Edwardian house with Edwardian windows with a Victorian slant to it, but now it's essentially a part of a council flat perhaps. It's, it's, it's a kind of place where uh, not very wealthy people live. Uh, in post 1947 England. So we see the transition, the economic transition through the architecture of England, right? The architecture belongs to our past. The house is perhaps built at some point during prosperity, but now it stands in the middle of uh, you know, a very impoverished England which can barely make its ends meet. And that's something which tells you something. The very architecture of the house tells you something about the cultural and economic condition in the play. Now, Jimmy Porter, as I mentioned, represents uh, a very complex kind of masculinity. So if you look at the gender studies and look back in anger in terms of the characters, you find immediately Luba, Jimmy Porter is someone who is a universally educated man who aspires to be an intellectual, aspires to be a genteel intellectual, but he knows he doesn't have the financial resources to become it, so he ends up running a sweet stall. In other words, he doesn't have the financial capital uh, to become a gentleman, to become something a, a, a force to reckon with. Uh, in the masculinist political map. So what does he have? He uses his cultural capital. Uh, so you know, he's been to university, so he speaks in a certain kind of way, he speaks in a certain kind of language, he uses that language to uh, his great uh, service in order to attack the woman, in order to become something, in order to seduce the people around him. So language becomes a commodity in Luke Bakkenang. And the mind you, when I use the word commodity in Look Back in Anger, so we talked about commodity in George Orwell's shooting an elephant, where everything was a commodity. The elephant was a commodity, the white man was a commodity, the action of the white man was a commodity, which had all been consumed by the Burmese people around him. So in a very similar way, uh, language becomes a commodity in Look Back in Anger, in the sense that Jimmy brought up, you know, with his uh, tweed jacket uh, and, you know, uh, pipe 
and it's jazz, uh, and it's a Sunday newspaper, and it's very, very educated language, full of metaphors and references and allusions. Uh, he's aspiring uh, to become something that he cannot be because of his financial constraints. So in other words, he doesn't have the financial agency uh, to be a powerful white man in England, uh, because the country itself is on its way out uh, in terms of its resources. So he cannot really be a powerful person anymore, though he aspires to be it. Now, in complete contrast to that, we saw Cliff, Cliff Lewis in Lubbock in Anger, who doesn't have any aspiration to become powerful. So he's someone Alice and Jimmy's wife can be very comfortable with. So Jimmy, his wife, and Cliff, although they have a very complex relationship, uh, more often than not, we see them in a very comfortable exchange with each other. Uh, they're talking to each other uh, in almost in terms of confessions, almost in terms of uh, you know, taking each other into confidence, etc. Now, we find, as I mentioned, uh, look back in anger uh, as, a, in, as a play which is deeply political because it belongs to an era where there's no dominant masculinity left in England. So, the two dominant uh, schools of masculinity in look back in anger, there the could have been the dominant schools of masculinity. One was imperial masculinity, uh, which is now on its way out because uh, you know the very uh, phenomenon, the very process, the very uh, existence of imperialism is gone, disappeared. Uh, you know, after 1947 and this is 1956. So there's no imperial masculinity left in England. Uh, and in other words, uh, in, in, in other sense, there's no masculinity which has come to replace it. So we have one can't look at Jimmy Porter as a replacement of imperial masculinity. So he's not someone uh, who's going to step in and become the next hero because he cannot. He doesn't have the resources. He's not allowed the resources to become the hero in 1956 England. Right? So uh, I think I did mention uh, the significance of the play in terms of the cultural condition because remember, this was a play which is, you know, the setting of the play is post-1944. And 1944 is important because 1944 was a time of the Education Act in England, which essentially allowed a free education, free university education to all boys and girls in England, which, which is why someone like Jimmy Porter, someone with his working class background, could go to a university and graduate from a university. Because in normal circumstances, someone like him could never step into a university because you know, it would cost him a fortune. Uh, you know, he never can become a university graduate. He never could become a university graduate without the help of the Education Act. The Education Act changed everything. So, you know, it allowed people like Jimmy, boys like Jimmy Porter, to get into university, get a degree, get out with a degree, and obviously come with some kind of a cultural capital. So that was quite good. But what is not so good, and what, what makes the play more complex, is a failure of the act. Because, you know, post-university graduation, post a degree from the university, these boys and the girls, these men and women, they found themselves essentially jobless. So what's the point in having a university degree if that doesn't guarantee you a job, if that doesn't guarantee you any profession? So Dream Porter ends up running a sweet store, which is something which he would have done if he, were just, uh, he, if he just stayed working class. But he did not stay working class. He got into university, got a degree, came out of the university, and then found himself getting back in the working class again, running a sweet store again, because he didn't have any option left. Now, obviously, he cannot do that anymore because he's been to university. He's, he talks in a particular way. So, in other words, he's been corrupted by culture. So, culture has corrupted him in the sense that, you know, he's someone who is in the middle of nowhere. He's in no man's land. He can never be a pure working class person. Or in other words, uh, he can never be a real working class person. And in a, in a very similar way, he can also never become a pure posh person, a pure genteel person, a pure gentleman because he doesn't have the financial resources to become a gentleman. He's always going to be a no man's land. So in a very interesting way, look back in anger can be seen as a, a production of a no man's land. So this generation of Jimmy Porters, which uh, uh, is a generation uh, of this Education Act in 1944, they found themselves completely disillusioned, completely cynical about the entire political system, or the entire education system, which uh, characterized England at that point of time. Now, uh, coming back to the specificity of the play, so we saw the opening of the play, the two men sitting reading newspapers, uh, smoking a cigar, uh, a pipe, uh, Jimmy, uh, and then the, the, the wife, the woman, uh, you know, ironing a pile of clothes in an in, 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 in a, in a ironing board, and all that put together becomes a very interesting, very complex cacophony of human voices. Now, uh, Jimmy Porter, uh, you know, more often than not, he speaks in a rhetoric of rage. Uh, he's almost always angry. Uh, his anger, as I just mentioned, is almost always directed at the woman, the body of the woman. Uh, you know, he, he gets quite vulgar sometimes. He talks about the genitalia of the woman. He talks about you know, the body of the woman in very, very visceral, violent metaphors, especially when it comes to talk about his... Uh,